Yeah, uh, we're recording now. Thank you. So, but this part, don't worry, because I'm just mimicking what's in the tutorial. So it's it's written there uh, step by step. So, but if you do not find it immediately, or if your editor does not find, if PyCharm does not find your editor immediately, you can come here, go on the environment, just wait a bit. It may take a while to find your environment, but it should appear here. For example, here he is finding a different environment. For example, mine is called DV here. Professor, esse não aparecer nada. O meu está vazio. Oh, if it doesn't appear, which is is kind of a harder situation, you can find it uh, manually. So, but I don't know. Do, uh, do you have a Mac or a Windows? Windows. Okay, th that makes it easier. So, for example, you go to your main directory. Go to users, your user. This is like the worst case scenario when it doesn't find your interpreter. In the users, there should be something like dot anaconda or dot conda. Here should be, or it's not the dot anaconda, it's dot conda. Environments, yeah. Here are the your environments, the ones that you've created. For example, I have two, one called Sandbox and another called DV. You open your environment. It opens up, uh, up and opens up a lot of things. You try to go to the very end and you click on the python.x inside of your eggs inside of your environment. So that's the file that tells the PyCharm interpreter what to run, because the libraries of your environment are also here in the library paste or libs. Yeah, but you're kind of in the, you're kind of in the worst case scenario. Hello, teacher. Yeah. On the installation options of the PyCharm, there's any specific uh, options that we have to choose or just click next? Yeah, it's all, all, all next. Okay. Don't, don't, Thank yeah, you. don't worry. One of the options is, for example, using dark mode instead of the, the standard light mode, which is brighter or white. So did anyone else had any issue connecting your PyCharm with the correct interpreter? This is important because this is the only way, it's not the only way, but this is the way to run code on PyCharm. So you need to have an engine so it knows how to run certain commands or the Python commands. So, but after you correctly choose your interpreter, Hopefully you don't get to this stage because it's the hardest stage. You just create, uh, sorry? In fact, I'm in, at this, this stage. I have a Mac hook uh, and I'm not finding the interpreter neither in the dot conda. I only have the option which is environments. So I open the conda folder yeah. and I have the environments.txt no further environments but maybe i will create an, a new one and try it again what what you what you can do which is kind of bothersome because you'll have it installed in both places you simply connect to your native python environment which do, does it appear your native python environment or do you have an option to click on in terms of interpreter uh, so mm -hmm. for example uh, oh this new Virtual environment, let me check. New, yeah, I have Conda there. Yes, but I don't have the python.exe. Oh, and I'm then, missing that file. Then simply create a new environment. Okay. You, you, it will take a while because it, it will install Python in a new di directory. And after that, You'll have to install manually dash and botly. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, could you please go back to the um, to the existing interpreter just to see the path? Okay, okay. So if it doesn't appear here, which would be the best case scenario, for me it appears, but probably because I have done this already, you go here. No, I don't, yeah, I don't have nothing. Yeah, Conda environment. Here should be the second best option appearing here. It might take a mm. bit to find it, but... No, it doesn't appear as well. So I have yeah. to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to put the path, right? Yeah, if it doesn't appear, you need to find the path. Normally you open your disk or SSD, whatever. Mm -hmm. Users, uh, your user, mm -hmm. in the dot .conda. Okay. There's M's. There, there should be your, the environment that you named. So it would be, should be familiar, familiar to you for, or DV or whatever. Do you see it? No, I just have uh, under dot .conda, I just have environments dot uh, txt you don't have but amps no did you yeah, create have, yeah i have the i have an account but just just move on so we don't lose much time and then i'll try to figure it out but do you remember creating an environment in anaconda so I was using Anaconda with Jupyter Notebook, so I must have an environment, right? Running Python code. It or might be necessary. it might be your root environment that doesn't appear here. So yeah. But moving on, you can do the same as your colleague. You can create a new environment and okay. in that environment you can install again. You'll have Dash and Plotly in both places. But All right. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, but, this part is is very important and normally there are issues. Uh, yeah, I'm recording the... Oh yeah, I've, I've just seen your post, teacher. Some students are having problems with the password. Yeah, I'm recording, but... Well, that, that's an issue. Are there many students that aren't being able... that are not able to enter the class? While you answer, I'll just keep going. So this is the most important part because this is the step that allows you to run the dash code. We can no longer use Colab, which is an issue because this this part requires your your computer. Okay, I've muted you. Sorry. This part requires you to to run an application, and Google Colab does not allow it. So you really need to have it in, on your computer. So, but for those, uh, yeah. I, I just installed the, the PyCharm. Yeah. Now, should, should I, sorry, I was I was not listening. Okay, uh, okay. But, but I choose Conda environment, so I, cre I create a new project on the new environment using, uh, and then, or I'm not sure if you were. Okay, yeah, yeah about this. sure. More or less, but it's okay. So, you have an environment installed, right? Yeah, I have. You create an environment where you had installed your Dash and Plotly. I'm not sure, but I have three options. Uh, what are the names of these options? Virtual, ENV, Pipe, and V, and Conda. In, oh, where though? Where I was here, for example, where I, I have my mouse on? No, I just launched the program, I create new projects, and I was just checking the, the environment options. Yeah, so up there you have virtual. Okay. Oh, up there. Oh, here. Uh, there, there, yeah. Okay, but know. you should always click on existing interpreter because it will connect to something you already have. Oh, and okay, here, if you are lucky, it should appear. Your if you are lucky, yeah. Sometimes it's kind of like I'm unlucky. <laughs> I'm unlucky. Okay. Yeah. So good. if it doesn't appear here, what you do is come here, uh, the triple dots on the environment, and here it should appear. For example, here it doesn't appear my sandbox environment. It only appears my DV environment. If it doesn't appear here, which is not the worst case scenario as you've seen, but kind of uh, troublesome, you just need to find the path where your environment is. And to do it, you just open your uh, your disk, 
yes. users, your user, the dot on the folder, then environment, E N V E S M S. And do you see your environment here? No, I don't have it. Yeah, maybe let's skip and. So yeah, that's probably because you uh, you it's haven't. The same yeah, you haven't. Maybe you haven't created an environment. Yeah, but, maybe. Okay, but moving on. So. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. So most of you managed to get to this part, right? I'll assume that. So remember that you had a path. You had chosen a path where your project is. So I would like to ask you to drop the folders from this class, lesson five, which are class five, example one, etc., inside that path. So if you go here, you all, you all have something here, probably is untitled, whatever name you gave it. And you go to direct, uh, show in Explorer, it will open an ex, uh, it will open in the folder section of your computer an empty folder probably i would like you to drag the class documents here so you can access them in pycharm so again you click on the folder that appears here it is created when you create a project here there's an option showing explorer and it will open open that particular folder that should be empty and you drag these lessons folder uh, files into there after that you should be seeing the same things as i am yeah inside that folder yeah it should look exactly like this for my yeah, exactly like this. This one. The folder has dot idea. Oh yeah, you, maybe you're putting it, it opens up on the previous folder. So you need to enter your the folder of the project. Professor. Yeah. The the files are not the ones that you sent uh, by email are, are in Moodle. Is yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. And they are the ones in okay. Moodle. In Moodle, you, you, yeah, you, in Moodle, you have two more files, which are the PDF files with the tutorials. So, but you can drag them there as well. So in the meanwhile, while you are doing this, uh, I will I would want to ask you to since there are people that can connect to go to the other PDF file, which was let me just which was the implementing a dash based web application on your Google, and let's go through it as well. So this is a requirement for for the project. You need to have this setup. And don't worry with the with your computer because this is all web based, so you don't have any installation requirements whatsoever. So I'll just wait uh, just a bit longer so you can set up your PyCharm. It should look exactly like mine at the moment you finish it. But for those of you that have already finished, you can start doing the the other PDF part. So I'm doing this because since there are people that haven't managed to connect the PyCharm yet, uh, you can all achieve the same results. It takes a lot longer in terms of time with this method. So what this is basically is implementing, uh, well, it's, it's what it says in the title, right? Implementing a web-based app. So you'll have your own website running so where, where everyone can see it, so that everyone can see it. And that will be your project.
So assuming that everyone has made it here or to this part, let's just go through this part now. So you need to create a GitHub account. For those of you that don't know, GitHub is um, a very known website that allows you to deposit your data and code in repositories, which basically are web folders, so to speak. And you can share your code, can work simultaneously on the same project, etc. There's a lot of applications, but let's treat it as a web folder for now. And what we'll do with this web folder is use a third party application, which is called Heroku, to get the code from there and implement that code online. So you have your application's code inside of GitHub and Heroku will catch, so to speak, that code and implement it or deploy it into a site or a web application. So what you first need to do is create an account, create a repository, a repository, which is basically a folder online. You can, you can go through these steps pretty easily, let's hope. So I already have an account. But if I want, you just build an account, just put your normal information, etc. Create a new oh, So we, we are we are seeing the um, by charm. Are you showing oh, something you're still, else? I am showing something else, yeah. So yeah, we are seeing the by charm. Okay. Okay, yeah, nice. Okay, I can change it here. Thank you. Uh, so I I was so showing the PDF file, but I didn't go through it uh, at all. So what you do is go to GitHub. Uh, I was in my account, so you, you first need to create a, an account, but after you create an account, you should see something like this. Mine already has some rep repositories, but it's fine if you don't have any. It's expected if you're just creating your account. You create a new repository. Here you put the name of your repository, etc. The only particular thing that you need to take into account is that it needs to be public. So your Heroku application, so the Heroku third party service can see it. After that, you should have something like this, but without any folders or files here. And what you do is drag the other files that were zipped into inside of this. So uh, your folder should look something like, you go to Moodle. So these ones are for today's class, but inside of this zipped folder, I'm just unzipping it to my, to my uh, desktop. You have a file called dash example master. And what you do, I believe you might not be seeing the same as I am, so let me just change it. So what you have after you unzip that folder is these three ones. What you do is go to the dash example master, open it, select it and drag it all inside your repository. So since, uh, since Zoom does not allow me to show you everything, you simply drag it on top of the repository. After that, it will show a pop-up where do you want to commit or not, and you just say yes. Professor, where did you click in the site? Is import code? I didn't see. Uh, sorry? Uh, when you, you are in uh, GitHub, yeah, okay. Where did you click? Would you create the repository and then what do you do? Okay, let me just show, okay. So you, you create a repository and you, you are here, right? Without any folders. No. Uh, ah, quick, quick step. I don't know if I drag and drop it, this works. I don't think so. So after you create a repository. No. I don't think so. What don't you think so? Mm, no, explain. Okay. Let's do it like that. You've just created your repository. You can click on mm -hmm. this uh, symbol here and it should appear 
your repository here. It should be the only one, right? Should be your username dash the name of the repository that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it appears. Okay, nice. Yes, it appears. I so, open it. Okay. Yeah, you open it, and now it, yes. it should appear something like this, but without any files. It only it maybe it should only have the readme file, which is an open text file. What you do um, now, but if it doesn't appear, it's okay. 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 It maybe it's empty. What you do now is drag those. Uh, four, or, uh, four or five files into here. And when you do it, you won't see my folder because Zoom doesn't allow it, but I'll show what happens. So it appears this. I've dragged this one, two, three, four, five files inside. And you simply uh, click on the commit changes. And what it does is simply uploads the files into your repository. Did you did you manage to do it? No, it doesn't work. How so? I don't know. I think it's my. No, I don't know. But but do do you see this this? Um, uh, because it's not like this. It's not like that. It's like quick step. If you've done this thing, then it's, it says or create a new repository on the command line or push an existing repository for the command line or import code from another repository. It's not like yours. I don't know. Why. Uploading existing file. Do you have this button? Existing quick file. setup. Get started by creating a new file or ah, uploading. Okay. uploading yeah. an existing file. Yes, click there and then you can choose your files. And then I, sh ah, okay, now I am on where you are. <laughs> At the same, same problem. Thank you. <laughs> so you. Okay, you. now it's equal. Okay, you. awesome, awesome. So you commit <laughs> changes, I'll do the same because I don't have it in this repository. So it might take a bit, but not long. It normally takes less time because the files are really light. So you have proc file, readme, app, emissions, full, requirements, and that's enough, right? This GitHub part is done. So now what we need to do is set up your Eruku so it can connect directly here. So if you see in the, in the tutorial, so to speak, You've just finished this part, and now you go to this link, or just type Eruku and sign in, H-E-R-O-K-U. So I'll do it. You create an account. So I already have an account, so I'll skip this part. But after you create an account, You should you should be in this part, right? Without the dashboards, but not yet. Yeah, I'll I'll wait a bit. So apparently there have been, there were people that couldn't enter the class even with the new password and so on. So that's an issue that will, will need to be fixed. Yeah, but so you've all managed to get to this part, right? So I'll do a new application with you as well. You just create new um, create new app in this new create new app. 
here you choose, it's better to choose Europe because it should be faster, right? Give it uh, any name that you want. So the name I believe should be unique. So if you try to type a name that already exists, it won't let you. So for me, Professor, I, yeah. Can you wait just a bit? I'm still trying to create an okay. account. And yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll wait a bit more. Thank you. So if you have any problem, feel free to just type it or say it. We use this opportunity. So uh, what, uh, I have uh, the PyCharm installed. Uh, and now to, to create a new project, okay. we need to drag and drop just the files to um, PyCharm. But you've, you've already created a new project? Yes. So you're, you're in this part, right? So you don't have any files inside, but you're here. Yes, yes. So what you can do, since maybe you, you know where the directory is, but if you don't, you can uh, right click the lesson five or whatever name you gave to your project, uh, show in Explorer, and it will open up the place where that folder is. Okay. You just open your folder and drag those files, uh, drag the files into there into that. Okay. In that. Okay, thank you. Nice. Okay. So, has everyone more or less managed to get to create an account? Or is there anyone, uh, sorry? I could create an account. Okay, okay, thank you. So yes, I'm, I'm done too. Okay, okay, so I'll move on. So here you just create a new app, not a new pipeline, a new application or app. Here you need to choose a name. It, it needs to be unique, which means if only one person can get that name. So for this example, I'll use DV class five. Should, this name should only contain lowercase letters. Okay, it can't be an underscore, it needs to be a, a dash. So just choose Europe, it seems faster, right? And create an app. So after you create an app, you'll be where I am. And you'll go, if you're not here, you'll go to the deploy option, which is the third, third option on the top. And this is where you'll connect your application to, the, to GitHub. And in GitHub, you will see the code and run it and deploy it online. So you click deploy, or if you're already there, awesome. In the deploy method, you'll choose GitHub. You can click there. Here, it will maybe ask you to connect to your, to insert the credentials of your GitHub account. So maybe it's not so quick as I was. But it will just link to the GitHub, open a new page, etc. It should be fairly quick. After you're connected to your account, for example, mine is N Alpelion. You'll just need to, you don't need to type your repository name, you just click search. And it will give you a list of folders or repositories to connect. Since you already, since you only probably have one, you'll choose the one that you've just created. Mine was DV Practical. So, and you simply click connect. 
So now, Professor, yeah. I can connect to my GitHub. It says, I don't know, an error. <clears throat> oh, the error disappeared. So what error appeared? Ah, oh, now what, it oh. worked. It worked now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Good. So after it, you connected, it should be the last time that you need to change this part. So it is forever until said otherwise connected to that particular repository. repository. And what you need or can do is either enable automatic deploys. What does this mean? Whenever you change GitHub, it will redeploy the application. Or you can deploy it manually in the deploy branch. You only have a, a, a one branch, which is called master. So you don't need to worry about that. So you have two options here. Either you enable automatic deploys, or you can, after you change the code and put it in GitHub, Go, come here and deploy the branch. For now, we can you can just uh, enable automatic deploys. So, and since it probably hasn't deployed yet, you also click on the de deploy branch. What this will do is, for the first time, go to your GitHub repository, find the code, and deploy it online. This all this takes uh, a while, like two to three minutes. So don't worry. This does exactly the same as PyCharm, but is much slower. And whenever you have an error, it will be much harder to troubleshoot because it won't show you the errors that you've got on your code. So what this is doing is going to the requirements.txt file that you that you put on your repository and seeing the requirements. So we had pandas, we had dash, we had plotly, etc. And he downloads it to the server. After that, he goes to the proc file and sees that the, it is a Python, uh, Python application. And after that, sees what is the name of the file that will be deployed. In our case, it's the app.py. After that, he goes to the app.py uh, file and runs the code. This is just an explanation of what the files themselves do, but it's basically that. You need requirements, you need a proc file that shows the engine and the file that will be ran, and you need an application itself. So for example, mine is says done, but after a bit, it will appear here a button that will allow you to go to your link. So let's just wait a bit longer. Okay, so in theory, you should all, after a bit, have this on your computer. If, and if you click view, it will redirect you to the your new newly made website. So if I click view, it gives you a, a generic website, a generic, no, a built website. So did anyone have issues with this part? I have an error after deploying and Sorry. when after deploying when I when I do the, the view, when I click the view, I go I have a page saying application error. So, oh, oh. I should check the the logs, maybe. Oh, the, the logs normally aren't that helpful because these are very, very not so in depth logs, so to speak. So, but if you use the same code, if you drag the same code as I did, it should not appear an error. So, what you can do is click on the deploy branch again, and maybe there was an error where it deployed twice. In, in GitHub, uh, we only needed to upload three files, right? Proc file, app.pi, and requirements. No, um, no, 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 no. The, it, 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 no. Ah, okay. So I missed that part. Yeah, it was, it was all of the files. 
for example, it was proc, uh, okay, okay. proc file app emissions and requirements. You're probably missing emissions. Yeah, okay. So I'll try it again. With yeah. That file. Thanks. So you don't need to redeploy now. You simply need to drag emissions. Since you already have the automatic deploys enabled, okay. what it, it does whenever it sees a change in your repository, it will automatically deploy. So, but everyone managed to to do it, right? Okay, I will assume yes. So, for so right now, anyone can access this site. So, as for, in your example, you probably have a different name. You surely have a different name, but it is public. So, congratulations! You have your first application. At least, maybe you have your first application. What you have now is the beginnings of your project. So you still haven't, we still haven't started with Dash, but what you'll need to change is the application itself, which we'll see how uh, after this. But uh, if the, everything went all right, you should have this set up very nicely. Also, for those of you that couldn't connect to PyCharm, you can also see the codes uh, you could also run the code through this method, but as you can see, the deployments are very slow. So, yeah, but it is a possibility as well. It's, uh, the only thing you need to have into consideration when changing this is that the name should always be app.py. So if you change the code inside, for example, here it has a code that we'll later see what it does more in, in specific. But you can change whatever you want here. It, it needs to run without any error. But the most important part is that the file must be named app.py. So, but did anyone have any other issue with this part? Okay. Okay, so hey, one, one question. So here we are we are talking about the uh, app.py file, but on the PyCharm we were looking at uh, the class five example. So yeah, these no, are okay. two separate things, right? Yeah, yeah, these are two separate things. Normally we wouldn't go through this tutorial, but so there's there's normally a lot of issues when going through this tutorial alone. So this time we wanted to do both things so everyone could manage it. But the PyCharm part is so that you can run it, run your code, see if it has mistakes or not. This particular part is when you want to implement your code online. So in terms of name, it is important to have the name because Heroku, when he, he goes to your, um, when it goes to your GitHub account, he will first look at the proc file. This is just um, a nuance. And you will go through this, he will see app server. So the, the file that has your application's code must be named app.py because it is a Python file. How can I see the chart that you showed before the globe? So, I don't know. You should all, all you should see this, the, you should be able to see the chart as well in your application. So everyone is when you open your app online, you should you everyone is seeing the same as I am, right? Okay, now I'm seeing after so I was missing that CSV part. Now, okay. Now I can see it. Sorry, Professor. Can yeah, I, sure. So you the, the previous um, uh, files, okay, where you add the code, for instance, uh, lesson one, two, three, four. Yeah. You, it's just to see if the code itself runs smoothly so you can like copy to your yeah. last file app.py so you can deploy it right yeah, yeah. because okay. it, it yeah it isn't feasible to troubleshoot and build an application only putting in okay. in a row quincing especially because when you do a mistake here it's harder to see what the error was because if you will you'll make mistakes we we all do in terms of the de deployment and the logs are not the same as in 
uh, PyCharm. So, so PyCharm really should uh, should we like you can still use like Jupyter Notebook for running the code engine and then copy to the, the file app.py or we yeah, must use yeah you, you can do that. The thing is you cannot deploy uh, you cannot deploy um, a, the, a dash application on Jupyter. Okay. So if you, you if you would try to run it on you copy the whole code and put it on a Jupyter cell, it wouldn't run. It's a limitation with Jupyter. Oh, okay. so that's why we've changed to PyCharm as well. So thanks. Yeah, so so right now you can build an application with PyCharm and you can also deploy it, putting it the code on um, on GitHub and then going to Heroku, etc. So what you're going to do in terms of a project is simply building an app and this should run smoothly. There normally are, are various deployment issues, but it will be a problem of the future. For now, you need we need to focus on how to build an app with Dash. So, Professor. Yeah, sure. I've, I missed uh, I missed last class, but just to get uh, a hang of it, um, we 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 are using PyCharm uh, um, and PyCharm doesn't allow us to to visualize the graphs that we are building, or it still allows us to to visualize as did um, uh, Jupyter Notebook. It does not. I, I know that in Jupyter Notebook, we were uh, adapting the code and then visualizing uh, iteratively to, yeah. to correct some mistakes. It is not the same way because that's the advantage of Jupyter. So, oh, okay. yeah. But you, you, now but you- to deploy, we learned in the class before how to deploy and the code that we did, or, or no, no, we no, are no, no. St still going to learn it? Yeah, we are still going to learn it. Right now, oh, okay. we, we haven't okay. learned anything about Dash. Okay, okay. So yeah, that's what, that's what we're going to do now, actually. <laughs> so, uh, there, so, so that we're all clear, there isn't any other issue in terms of, Git, uh, in terms of the GitHub Heroku deployment part. So everyone could manage to see the same as I do. In your particular website. So nice. Uh, yes. Good, good. So now we'll start with the Dash part. As you know, Dash is a library used to to deploy and to build web applications. Not to de it deploys as well using another. Doesn't matter. It's used to build web applications. And I don't know if you remember from the first class. But there are a lot of examples. You just you can just type dash app gallery and you'll end up in the same place as I did, where you'll later use to base your project on. So maybe this seems too complicated. Don't worry if it is simpler or not. But in terms of a goal in of, of a project, these ones are very good goals. Maybe too hard, don't worry. But here you'll find most of the interaction and et cetera components that you need. Also keep in mind that Dash has a very good doc documentation. If you go to this site, just type Dash Plotly documentation, you'll end up here. You, you also have tutorials what's and whatnot, sorry. So if you find yourself lost or in need of any extra stuff, or something that I might not have explained so well, you can either ask me or come here. Because sometimes the answer is simpler than you might think. So here you have a very good tutorial as well. Yeah. So, but going in the lines, going in the lines of using this website, there are two main, there are two main parts to learning Dash. First is what are Dash components and what are HTML components? So if you go here, ta, 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 you don't need to go here. I'm just going to show you because it's easier this way. There are two main aspects to Dash, which are the Dash core components, which means the code particular to Dash and Dash HTML components, which is components borrowed from the HTML language. So since we are programming in Python and we don't want to use that HTML language, which is sometimes harder to understand or learn, 
Dash offers us a lot of uh, functions that do exactly the same as the HTML functions do. You probably don't know what most HTML functions are, but if you come here, for example, and you choose the HTML.p, which is the uh, HTML, which in HTML is a paragraph, you simply wrap a string around your function or a simple wrap your function around the string and it copies out this code. So in term, for those of you that are familiar or know something about HTML, there's a big a connection between HTML language itself and HTML dash components. So, but it is better being viewed than, it's better to see the examples themselves than to, to talk since we don't have a board here. So I'd like you to open the, Class five example one. So for those of you that had issues with PyCharm, what you can do is simply name it app.py and drag it to your GitHub. You This deploys it as well, but you can see it in my computer. So you could do it, but yeah. So, as you can see, we import both of, dash, both of Dash's galleries, one of the core components in the HTML components separately, separate, separate, in a separate matter. Yeah. Change the window. We are seeing the Dash HTML still. Okay, thank you. I, I still, yeah, I still make this mistake. So thank you. So, uh, so you go to your pie chart and you go to the first file. So class five, uh, class five example one, and you'll see a very basic example of a dash application. So first we do the uh, required imports. So we, we import dash normally, we import the dash core components, we import the HTML components. We will also be using Plotly and in this particular case, we've imported pandas and numpy, but we are not using it. That's why it is faded out. So normally when building an, an application, first you need to treat or use or download your data set. In this case, we don't have a data set because it's a basic example, but we have several, several no, five points. One, two, three, four, five, and the Y being the double. So the point one, two, the point two, four, et cetera. Here we build a static plotly image. For those of you to, that remember, this, is, this will simply be a simple scatter image that prints out not a simple scatter, right? And here enters dash itself. So first of all, you need to initialize your application. This is the same for every application, so don't worry. This is a particular part of server deployment. So if you wanted to use only PyCharm, you wouldn't need to declare the server variable. Uh, for those of you that, that want to know, it's not really required. What this does is simply goes to Dash and asks it for the variable that will be used to deploy, it, to deploy in a server. So it um, brings out a variable called server that is used for the deployment. In our particular case, since we're not deploying it anywhere, you we're using it locally, we didn't we don't need this part of the code. But if we want to do deploy it in Heroku, we would need to strip down the server variable or uh, fetch the server variable. So in terms of building an application, this is simply a nuance. After that, you need the layout of your app of the, of your app. The layout, as intuitively as it might sound, is simply the structure of your application. We won't start with the complex layer layout. So this class, we won't look of how to structure an application. Normally, you have columns, etc. We won't go through that today. But here we have some simple objects that we'll go through now. So first of all, we have a div. A div is probably and mostly the most important HTML component. 
it is basically a container so a box where you put objects on and your uh, application is basically a big box with smaller boxes inside so and later on when building a large uh, structure so one box here one box on the side one below you'll have to take this into consideration but it's a box wrapper whatever you might call it but you always need to partition your data right your uh, components right so first of all building an application we have to have a wrapper or a container for it so an html.div component where everything will be inside so these five six lines of codes are our whole application the first thing that we insert is an html.h1 component which is basically a string of of the biggest size there is don't worry in terms of different components because we will end up only using like six or seven different components so eventually they will be very easy to know we, what they are so but one of the most important ones aside from the div one is the h1 the html, HTML components h can be from h1 to h6 so h1 h2 h2 h3 h4 etc what this represents is the size of the of the title so in terms of h1 this is the highest possible size of this title so when we deploy the server you'll see very big letters of my first dashboard being h6 the smallest size so this is simply a container that changes the size of the letters inside of it after that we have a container with some words with a pretty different size so this is simply an example of what you can do in terms of container you can put containers inside of containers etc and you should put it and here you have your first bash core component which is sorry the most distinct one and the most important because this is the component that receives your plotly figures sorry so as you can see here on top yes, sir. yeah question yeah, sure. in we did uh we did um, the age I, I i believe it represents like adder or something um when we say edge one it's the, the the first adder but then when we do example of html looking at the site that we built i i can see that it always all also contains some some information but we didn't specify the age uh it, it is not needed here in the example of HTML container, we don't put any H. HTML container. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is yes. the. Okay, I understand. So this doesn't have any change in terms of size. Okay. Yeah, so the, it's, it's standard like this. Yeah, yeah, it is the standard size, which you can change later with the global uh, variables. A global um yeah global variable so to speak but yeah it doesn't have any change whatsoever to it so it, it should be the standard size of every string or letter there is so um we were in the dcc.graph so id is very important to specify your your components you will later see but the id as the name indicates needs to be unique to whenever it need to be used, needs to be unique to every component. So keep that in mind, we'll see why later, but the ID is a very important part of the container and it's something particular to you, so the user doesn't need to see it whatsoever. So, but moving on, the graph container, uh, the graph component, what it does is simply takes on a figure and renders it in your application. So. Remember that on top we've built a normal, very simple scatter figure. We've compiled it in a go.figure object. And what we're doing here is simply saying, okay, this figure that we've built on top or before, I want to showcase it in my application. After that, we simply close our container dash application or application and we run it. This if name equal to mine, 
means that if you run the application directly, it will run it. So this is very used in programming. So what this is, is the um, underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, is a global variable. That's the name of the initial application that was open. If you have several scripts that use, uh, use each other, so if I open the script that used this script, this, that, uh, this name global variable wouldn't be main, but would be like secondary one or two. So this is simply to state that it, this will only happen if you run it, this script directly. So if you run it through other scripts, it wouldn't run. It would be false and it wouldn't do the app.run server. It's simply a new mess. I didn't understand uh, very well this part. Okay. Uh, uh, could you give us another example where this would, for example, matter? I believe here it's not uh, very important, but this just to show. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Where this wouldn't happen is that, for example, you had uh, in the example two, I would go to, oh, okay, I want to use this application from, from example one. What this would happen is that this underscore name wouldn't be mine. It would be secondary because you'd be going to this to this script through another script. So this is this is simply you know what it's not it's not important for this case because we are not going to use multiple scripts. But yeah, if we didn't put this, would we still get uh, uh, a graph in the pages and? and yeah, it, it 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 has nothing to do with the dash itself. It's simply a a standardized used thing. So it's, okay. yeah, because sometimes programs try to run scripts from other places and it might push out errors. In this case, it won't push out because it only allows it to be run when you try to run it manually dash directly. So if you try to run it through a third party uh, script, it will run. But nevertheless, it's not important for our uh, case. It was just one. So after that, you have your app built so you open an app after that you've defined its layout what you need to do now is app.run server right and this will deploy it automatically this debug equal to true feature is is very useful will when building an application because for example if you had a small mistake inside of your application it will give you the must it will print out the mistake so let's run the application first so we can see what i'm talking about if this doesn't appear to you, this class five example one, which is very possible, you simply right click your file, wherever, so, and run class, uh, class five example one. So, and this will run if you had your interpreter well set up. Oh, for those of you that created a new environment, you can add dash and plotly by going to file, settings, uh, project interpreter. So project lesson four, you have a different name project interpreter. You wait a bit here and you can add packages here. So. So I have a lot of packages. For example, I have Dask and Dash here, but you won't have Dash installed most likely. So what you do is click on the plus sign and this will give you a lot of possible packages and you simply search for the ones that you require. So you probably want Dash, you'll probably require Plusly. This is equivalent to installing it in, in Anaconda as we did in the previous classes or no? Uh, more or less, because this creates... A if we did it in Anaconda, we would still need to do it here? No, 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 no. no. This is simply for those, so for those who couldn't connect to Anaconda. So the ones that ah. in the two initial options were existing uh, interpreter or create new interpreter. Uh, the order was reversed. For the, we all tried to go to the existing interpreter, but some of the people didn't manage to do it, so... But I went, I went to existing interpreter, but so, in Anaconda, I, I, uh, in my environment in Anaconda, I didn't have Dash installed. 
so it's giving me an error dash in, in the other the other ones. Uh, when can... I ran it it gives me an error no module named dash. If that's the case, you can do can do this as well, yeah. Okay. And yeah. it, it will it will install in the environment. Yes. Or no. I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure if it, it will be particular to this project or if it will be in the whole in the environment. Oh, okay, okay, got it. That I'm not sure, but for those that couldn't even do that, that created a new environment, you can come here and it will create a particular environment for this particular project that can be used to different projects, but that's not the matter here, and install the required modules. So dash, plotly, and if any other mistake, uh, if any other error appears, like missing module pandas, for example, you can come here and install them as well. So, for example, dash and install package. Can we do this in, in the code? No, it's not possible. To it like, is. instead of import, we say something like install yeah. dash, I don't know. You can. Okay. But since we're using environments, it's not recommended. So okay. because I don't know if where it will install it. Sometimes it installs it in weird places, so it's better to keep it okay. more controlled. I don't have the project interpreter. Instead, I have a Python. It, it's not that. That's exactly what I'm saying. So it's not the same thing because do you get an error? So do you have when you try to run the code? Do you get no module name dash or no module name pad? So okay, yeah. So what you need to do is the same thing. So you're going to install in your Python interpreter dash and plotly. So you're kind of, kind of doing duplicate stuff. So you'll have dash in your anaconda and Python, but you can later uninstall it using this method as well. So the manage repositories. So with repeating, you go to file. Uh, so I'll do the, the same thing. So file settings project, the name of your project, you will have project interpreter. You wait a bit, but you have this plus sign here where you can install new packages. So, and here you type the packages that you're missing. So, so but moving on, if you click on the link, it will open up, uh, open up in your browser, your application. So let's do that. I know that I have to change to the browser. Okay. So in this particular example, I don't know if you remember, you have that H1 component that changes the string or the, the sentence to a higher size. You have a simple HTML container and you have your figure. I'm sorry, Professor, I got lost because changing views and, and trying to keep up sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's hard, I know, yeah. So, okay. How did, how did you get to, to this uh, address? Oh, it's running on, okay. So you just copy no, I don't, the, it, the result? No. You don't need to, it opens, it prints out the link on below. So let me Where? let me go back to PyCharm. Oh, you just press the link and you open it in the browser. Okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah. You can continue. Okay. Also, a very important thing. So whenever you want to, we will do that later. But whenever you stop using your application, you need to disconnect it because there's a possibility that you have two applications at the same time running and that will give you all sorts of boring stuff. So don't forget to close your application when you stopped using it. That's very important because you'll, you, if you try to run, it, to run another one, you will only see this one. So the first one that you ran and it didn't stop will be always be the default one. So don't forget to stop your application after you've seen it. But, um, oh, I, I was still saying, if we go to, if I, I want to show you that, okay. So, Zoom is not really helping out, but, okay. So, 
if you come here to the to the link, you can already notice that you have the H1 component, you have a container that has a, a generic sentence, and you have your figure that you've built. So this is pretty standard. As you might imagine, you could already build a lot of stuff with this. You already know how to make big letters and sentences and in, input figures. So whatever figure that we've built until now, you could simply build it again and put it inside of a dcc.graph component. So in terms of static figures, so I can change anything, you can do everything that you've, we've already learned and put it here. So that's very good. Our next objective is that, for example, I had, I, I wanted to, uh, for example, I want to have interactive, an interactive visualization. So imagine I wanted to change the information on the Y axis. So this is what we're going to learn now, which is the most important part of this functionality of Dash, which offers you a very pretty and not that easy, but easier way to implement this interactivity on a web application. So this is what we're going to do now. But in terms of initial in, initial learning curve, what you need to have into consideration is the HTML components H for header, right? Which goes from H1 to H6. And the most important of them all, the dot .div. In terms of structuring your application, this will be very important, especially when we try to build more complex visual uh, applications, so uh, horizontal boxes, etc. But for now, you need to have those into consideration, and you need to have the dcc.graph, which is simply a wrapper for your for your plotly figures. You can put whatever plotly figure you want there. So whatever, whichever one we've learned you now, it could be exactly exactly the same thing in this example. So, but moving on, now we'll, we'll try to introduce some interactivity. And since the, this is called callbacks and they have a very particular structure, and this is, this will be, at least I figured out in the beginning that this would be the hardest part of the practical course because it, this is where you'll be required to know uh, more of Python than the previously needed, right? So until now, yeah, you needed to know Python, but you only built dictionaries and whatnot. Like yeah. now, you you really you really need you will really be required to build functions and filter data sets. So yeah, but we'll start slowly. Don't worry. So if we go back to PyCharm, uh, okay, I need to show you PyCharm. Okay, this is easier, this one. So moving, moving back to PyCharm, first of all, you need to stop your application. Remember, if I try to run a new one, this will be the only one shown, so stop it and be sure that it is stopped. So. There is no green light anywhere, no possibility of stopping, so very important. And now, first we'll go to the example two, which is a, a new application that has two new components. Uh, one new component actually, and it has a callback, so you, you can run it already, so no, no harm there. And, play with it, it's nothing nothing special, but this is like the simplest way of understanding what a callback is. So first of all, you initialize or declare your application as a dash application. In terms of layout, you use a dcc.input uh, component and you use, use another container, this time it is empty and you close your layout. So in terms of intuition, using your intu intuition in terms of structure, it has one component and it has a container, which in this case it's empty and it empty and has a particular ID which you call div. What we wish to do in this particular case is whatever we type in the component input, as you might imagine, 
appear, appears in the diff component. So basically what we're doing is connecting two different components together. So if you run it, we can run it for now. So it is easier to understand. Okay. You should all be seeing this, right? It's not it's nothing special, it's just a small box and a sentence. And it has already typed initial value. But you can type whatever you do, whatever you want. So and as you can notice, whatever you type is printed out below. As you might imagine, this is the beginning of many applications. But this is the simplest example of connecting two different components together. And you do that, as you can see below, through callbacks. So what are the requirements to connect two components together? So going back to PyCharm, first of all, you need to uniquely identify each component. So that's why we use the ID parameter. So you have the ID, this component we called input, and the other component we've called, let me just put up the, sh the sh chat room just in case. Okay, we've called the first component uniquely, there are not a lot, so it would be easy not to mess that up. Uniquely input and the other one div. And what this is, is simply an empty box with the name div. You, it needs to be unique. Also, this input component, as you might imagine, is a way to input strings or texts, has the value, which is the initial value of initial value, and is of type text. Typing is very important, but it's not the important part here. So what you need to have into consideration here is that you have two components uniquely identified or identifiable that we're going to connect. So whenever you change one of those, the other will change as well. You do this through the app.callback at app.callback, where first you, you decide what will go in and what will go out, which is input and output. And then you define a function or a single function that uniquely changes the input and returns the output. So this is the hardest part to understand, but this is a very particular structure. What you need to have is define the output. So we will output the result of this connection dash callback into a component of ID div. Naturally, it will be our div component. We, we want to introduce it in the children in the children property of the div component. Uh, the in terms of HTML, children is the content of that HTML uh, component. So, children will be a very used term when, especially when talking of HTML. When you say children, is the contents of that component. So it's it's nothing else. It's simply a particular name. So we've connected in terms of output to that particular div, and we want to put whatever we are going to use inside of its children, so our uh, content. After that, we need, to, um, we need to enunciate the inputs. So in this case, whenever this component ID input changes, in particular, its value uh, parameter, which naturally is what we're changing, this callback will be triggered. So don't worry if this takes a bit to understand. This is the hardest part, don't worry. So we are connecting two components here uniquely, one that is used as an input and the other that will have an output. We need to connect their particular properties. So for example, this component's property had values, had type, had ID, I didn't know, but had more properties. So we need to define in particular which property we want. They're always the same, don't worry. So it's either children value or figure in terms of graphs. So nothing very different there. And after that, 
the next function that is defined. So for those of you that know, don't understand very well Python, this is the way to define a function. You type def, the name of the function doesn't, doesn't need to have any particular name. The input of the function doesn't have to, doesn't have, to have a particular name. And then we do the changes and return a value. So since this was a very simple, um, was a very simple function, as you don't remember, you simply copy the content of that and replace it with this string. There's not much of a function. But uh, yeah, and this is simply a, a way of you've entered. So this is always the same, this is static. And then whatever it's inside of here will be the input value. And the input value doesn't need to have any particular name. So this name is not connected to whatever is written here. It is simply the first value that comes out of inputs. Since as you might imagine, we can have multiple inputs. It will be this one in this case, because we only have one, but it doesn't have to have any particular name. I know this is kind of hard to explain, especially without a board, but do you have any questions? So that we can all go through like, any generic questions that you might have? So did you more or less understand what I, I said? I have one I had question. Some, some trouble. Sorry? I had uh, some, some trouble understanding some, some of the, 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 the definitions. I, I don't know what, what the value uh, means. Uh, in the end of, of the callback, you yeah. have a value. Here? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I didn't understand it very well. And then the, the calling of, of, of what we, we did pre previously. Uh, I'm not getting it fully. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is not easy to explain as well, so to understand. So the, the main thing that a, a callback or at this particular callback does is connects two components together. We can connect more, but for, for now, let's just connect two. We have components that give information, the inputs, and we have components that receive the information, the outputs. And in between, we can change that information, obviously, to, to transform it. So in this case, we're not transforming at all because we are simply copying and pasting it, but we could do a lot of things. So one of the dashes examples is like you input a number and the output will be the multiplication by something. You can transform that number, but the important thing is that you receive something, in this case a value, which we'll go through that again um, after this. You transform that into something else and then you put it on the other component. So, and whenever you change your input components, this will be triggered. So wh whenever I typed something on the input core component, which is simply an empty box where you can type stuff, it will trigger this event or callback and it will change the output, which was an empty container. Ah, so, so, so when we, we type something as you did in the, in the example that you showed on, on the web page, yeah. you typed something and we are doing the, the, the input is, is grabbing what, what you typed and, and, and saying grab this and this should be the value. What you typed is, is the value or no? Yeah, 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 this this is this is a part a property particular to dash core components. So after this, we were going to see that because there are a lot of possible components, but this one in particular is an input which is an empty box with where you can type stuff, and whatever okay. you change in those components, it will be the property value. Okay. Okay. This is the initial then, value, right? So okay. if you change it, and the then, property will change as well. Sorry. And then, and then the output, the output, uh, it it transmits to the the div part, and mm. to id div what what you what what you typed in in the value. I don't understand why why it's the children. You said, 
Oh, that, that's a particular um, thing of HTML. Yes. The contents of a component, so what's, in, what's inside of it, so what we see, it, ah, okay. it's their children. It's called children. The children. Yeah, it's called children simply. It's the name of the property that which is the yeah. what's inside now. Okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, but what we do is okay. We we receive the receive a value whatever is inside of the property value from the input whenever it is changed. The value starts at confusing, initial. Confusing. It's confusing that the input is is uh, after the, oh. the output. But, but it can be before, it, it doesn't need to ah, be after, yeah. Okay. It could okay. be before, it's simply how it's, actually it should be, but it's simply how we read it, yeah. Okay, and then and then the function that you were uh, explaining, if we don't have the function, we won't uh, obtain... It will print um, the error. Okay, yeah, the callback, so the function just just applies the the call black, callback in, in some way or, or not? The, not the function is like a middle ground where you can transform stuff. So where you can, yeah, okay. transform. Okay. So if you see this as a connection between between two components, what we, we do here is simply connect it and in the middle allow it to change. So for example, if we wanted to change um, the, uh, the scope now, the, the scale of something, of a, a figure, you need to change that figure. This is where you would reassign the new figure. That would be a, a more complex example. But right. here you're allowing yourself to change something based on a new information that the user inputs, whatever you want. In in the function, what is the, the syntax of the function and what is actually um, user defined? I mean, okay. yeah, okay. where is... So a, a function in Python, it's always the same structure naturally and you first need to use the def def uh, you need to def something so it need, always needs the def space okay. the, the name of okay. the function it can be whatever you want and the, in this mm -hmm. case in particular it can be whatever you want after that you need the input value so whatever it's going to be used inside of the function it needs to be inside of parentheses and then double points. Here you define the name of the function and what's going to the inputs of a function. So here we only have one input. So if I wanted to run this function after this, I would I would simply need to do this. So input value and for example as. After this, you always you can do whatever you want inside of the function, but you always need to return something. That's also all, also part of the definition of a function, and this is the input and output as well. And how how does this function get the value that we defined uh, initially? Oh, um, Where, this is not this is why the the name here only matters for what we're doing inside of the function it doesn't matter what name we choose. So this this value will always be the first input that we receive. The name does not matter. I could ah. choose whatever name I wanted. It would need to be the same inside of the function, but for it doesn't for um, for the callback we can choose whatever name for the input that we want. So so the function uh, meaning that the callback always needs a function yes. after it. Okay. Yeah. One function, okay. and yeah, that's this is the required structure always. Okay, I got yeah. it. Yeah, this is the hardest part, so don't worry. So after this, it, you will have harder harder callbacks, but it will always have the same structure. So the only harder part will be the Python language itself. So if you want to do complicated stuff, it will be harder. But the structure is very important that you understand. So. Don't worry. So in, in so this particular, uh, okay, yeah. One, one, one question. So to, um, after a callback, we need to define always a function. Yes. Okay. Because I was struggling a bit because we were defining the function, but it, it the perception is that we were not using because we are oh. not calling the function itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very particular to Dash's callbacks, yeah. So for example, here we could, what we're doing here is simply, 
putting inside of this sentence the input value, which is whatever we type, but we could simply return the input value. This would be a function without any transformation, but it would be required to have a function nonetheless. So, yeah, you always need a function. So, but moving on, don't, don't worry with this. With, with this, it's harder, but it's always the same. So, moving on. As you might understand, there are a lot of types of inputs, right? Of inputs or components. So this is the most basic component, but if you go to a website, you probably won't see an empty uh, text box. You will have a lot of options. And this is exactly what we have here, which we will run. But first, do not forget to stop your previously run uh, application. Because if after you, if this is very important, because if you are running it and you forget to close it, and for example, you close your PyCharm editor, you will probably need to restart your computer to stop your application. So it is very important that you always stop your application. So, but now let's go to the dash, door, uh, dash underscore core components example. And th these are a lot of components, but this is simply to show, showcase you and after that, you can use them also. The many are the different components that are in Dash, at least the most important ones, the most used. So you come here, you simply run it. It's better to see what they do and then see the code. So you just click on the link. I hope, oh, okay. So, and you'll come to this place, obviously, there's not not much of a visual uh, visual aspect to this or good visual aspect to this. This is simply to showcase you all of the different and possible uh, components there are in terms that of interactivity. So these are components designed to be the input of a callback. So as you might remember, we, we were we have been using we have been using our emissions data set. And in some of our visualizations, as you might remember, since there were a lot of countries, the visualizations were so stacked that there was very little understanding to it. But maybe it would make sense to choose a couple of countries or some countries that might interest you for comparison. But since every person is different and every person might want to see a different country or a different group of countries, it's not feasible to just choose yourself the country so we want to give the the people the option to choose themselves the countries and i, I talk countries i i can say whatever in terms of visualization and for example the drop down you can use all of them I, i've only chosen three countries here so it doesn't look very stacked is a very good way to choose one particular country there is multi-select drop down where you can choose multiple countries text input we've already gone through it we have slider as you might imagine, this might be good for continuous stuff or for years. Thinking about our country's example, a range slider is also a slider, but can go either. We can change either, either the max or the mean. <coughs> this text area simply gives the user the possibility of changing the size of the text itself in terms of text input. Radio items are also very neat stuff, uh, neat option, but it's unique. So keep that in mind. Checkboxes is the same as radio items, but you can choose multiple options. So this might, this is to give you uh, an idea of the interactions you can offer to your user when, when trying to design a web page. So there's a lot of options. I've applied it to the countries, uh, to, to our emissions data set mindset, but you can apply it to wherever you want. So, but now if you go, if we go back to the code, as you might imagine, well, there will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine components. So as you, as you remember, the code will be kind of stacked. So a lot of code, but it is important to understand, not all of them because most of them are the same, but how they work. So I'm also giving you this code in terms of a glossary. So when, 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 you, when you're doing your project, you can copy particular components 
and simply change small things to apply to your problem and it will be easier. So in terms of understanding, it might be easier as well and usage. So what we have here is simply we've imported the normal, the, the normal um, libraries. We've also imported datetime and I don't quite remember why, but we'll see that later. So we first define a dash application again. So we, uh, we open up a variable of type dash where we'll change the layout, etc. In the layout, we have a B container that will have all of the different uh, dash core components. So nothing in there. What we're introduced now is the HTML.label component. As the name implies, it's simply a label. It could be, for example, an html.h1 or h3 component. We've simply chosen labels so we can showcase different HTML components, but it's simply a text, uh, a box with text in there. The first core component is that dropdown. It has an ID. It doesn't require an ID, but naturally, since we are going to use this in a callback context, you also you always need an ID to uniquely identify it. The options are very particular to dropdown. We'll see that later in the value in either or in all the dash core components is the initial value of that component. So it is a property or variable that is, can be changed by the user, but it needs to take an initial value. And we already defined it here with the PT so for Portugal. So these options variable, which is defined above, as you might imagine, is the ones that have Portugal, Spain, and France. So, and if you go back to the site, to the dropdown itself, so you can make a quick connection between it, it has Portugal, Spain, and France. So when you go back here to the, to the, to the options def definition, you see Portugal, Spain, and France. And it has, it is an, a list of dictionaries where each dictionary has two entries, one label and one value. And each of the, each of the list entries is one of the dropdown options. So the label is what the user sees. So we are seeing Portugal, we are seeing Spain and we are seeing France. And the value is what is given inside of the, of the application. So for example, in, uh, in a data set where we have very obscure names or not so pretty or visual appealing names, we, we might want to use them here in the value where the user doesn't see it. But for the user itself, we are going to choose a, a more appealing name. I'm giving an example for you. This is a, a, a very good example because we don't want to show PT, we want to show Portugal. So we put a label Portugal, so user knows Portugal and the machine or the callback will receive PT. And that's why the initial value is PT and is given as Portugal when we visualize it. Here we have... So, so one question. Yeah. But, uh, for instance, if we have the 100 country, we have to do it like one by one, that mapping in the code? No, no, no. no. Well, well we, if we had very ugly, we don't need to have it. So we can do it that iteratively and automatically so uh, I'm giving a the answer is no there's a way to do it automatically naturally with pro uh, with Python programming but this is just to showcase the required structure of this variable so the options variable which is the same for most of the components that have multiple options to choose from so as you might imagine the drop downs and this and the radio check boxes etc will all share these options that's why you only have one option for the, for them all. But the answer is no. And if you want to see an example of how to do that for our emissions data set, I believe there's there's one in example four. Uh, we probably won't have time to go to example four, but nonetheless, there is an option to automatically or iteratively do it without typing a hundred countries manually. Uh, Okay, uh, moving on. Okay, so now we have to, we introduce two more HTML components. This is a BR for break and HR for line break. So 
if we, if the BR does not show anything visually, simply separates better the components themselves, so they are not so glued together. And the H, HR this, uh, draws a line, literally draws a line between the components. That's why you're seeing lines between all of the different components. This is simply a, a component that may not have much use. The HR, the break is, is useful to separate the components, but it's simply a showcase of different stuff. So label again, here you have a multi-drop. The multi-drop, as you might imagine, allows you, is a, it's the same component, but has the multi option to true. It allows you to choose more than one option at the same time. So keep in mind here that we, in the value we had a string, here we have an array. When you're doing your application, this is the kind of place where mistakes will happen. So you're, you're used to using a string and now you want a multi option, so you need to use an array. So, so mistakes will happen here, but in terms of uh, troubleshooting, it will be very, very quick. I want to go now to the other uh, components, but as you might imagine, this is simply a showcase. So you see what it produces and you can see the code. So if you change one thing, you can change it on the other side. So in terms of learning, it's much better than to just trying to discover how to do it. So, but moving on, let's try to see at least the example, the third example, which is the um, an example, a more useful example of a callback. So, firstly, let's just stop the application. Never forget. After you're sure that you've stopped running the pre the application, let's go to example three. Here, we are using one of the the data from one of the exercises given by Professor Pedro Cabral. I don't know if you remember, but it was the exercise that had um, different product, the sales of different products throughout three months. So we had product one, blah, 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 uh, product two until product six for July, uh, August, and September. And we want to showcase that data. But we want to give the interactive possibility to the, the interactivity to the user to change the month itself. So instead of giving you all the months or just choosing one month we are allowing you the user to choose whatever month you want to visualize so here you have the options which will go to the drop down as you can already see it's fairly similar in at least only the names changes change to the ones that you've seen in the dash core examples example here we define or open the dash variable, the app variable. Again, this server variable, which is only needed if you're deploying it online. Here we have it, but it wouldn't be necessary. Here we have a very simple layout compared to the last one that you've seen. We have a title of the biggest size possible. We have a break, we have a label, which is a, a box with the title as well, but with a, diff, a smaller size. We have a dropdown, which we've already seen. So it has a particular ID, unique ID, options. We already know how to do it. The initial value is July, which is the name of the column. And now we have an empty graph. So this is a new thing. So we you don't need to define the initial value of a graph when you have callbacks. So I'm giving you the, ex I don't know if you remember, but when we seen the, we, when we saw the first example, we first defined the graph, and then we immediately gave it to the graph component. It's not a value; it's a figure. Sorry. So th this obviously didn't have any callback whatsoever, but it is a static visualization that we first defined, and then we gave it to inside of the layout. Now what we are doing is defining an app, uh, a layout of an app where the graph component doesn't have a graph whatsoever. So this is also another important thing when thinking about callbacks is that when you initialize an app, which means when a user enters your web page, the callbacks will automatically run, even without any user changing one of the callbacks. So, and they will run with the initial value that you give them. So if this didn't have an initial value, the app would run 
and it would simply print out an empty graph because as you can see below, the graph is defined inside of the callback. So that's a, a thing to take into consideration. Callbacks run also when, you, when a user enters a web page. That is why it is very important to have an initial value inside of every component, which is the ver value property. In this case, going inside of the callback, we have an output in, into the graph. The component property here is figure. This is only particular to the dcc.graph component, so very well partitioned in terms of using figure or value or child, uh, children, yeah. So that's okay. And we are receiving as, the, as an input the values of the dropdown that has ID drop and values, right? And the possible values starting at July are either July, August, or September. You can see it here, but those were exactly the names of the columns for each, for, uh, for the, of the three columns of the data set. So, yeah. And here we are inside of the callback, defining um, a bar plot. So it is of type bar. The Y values will be defined by the column that we choose. So each column is, ref is referencing a month and each entry is referencing a particular product. So what we have here in the initial value, which is July, July is the product one in July, product two in July, etc. This text template disregard is simply a, a, new, a, a new feature that I found out. So not, uh, nothing special there. In terms of layout here, we only change the range, which means the scope of the label and its name. After that, we return a, fig a built figure. So making a direct comparison with the first example, instead of building a figure statically and feeding it to the, uh, the dcc.graph object, here we define it in a, in a dynamic way. So whenever someone changes the, the input, which is the Dropbox, you will build a new figure without information. So did, did any of you have a question? So, but moving on, if you run, if you run this, okay, let me just change to, to Mozilla. So if you run it, you have a title. Remember, you have the a break. This is it's the small separation. You can try taking off the .html.br. It would simply put them together in a very weird manner. That's why we use breaks or br. We have that component that had our three predefined labels. And whenever you change a label, it will change the graph itself, right? So that new feature was to put the value on top of the bar uh, in with bold. So that was that new feature that I was that I've put. So any question regarding this one? So this is the first time we are building a figure inside of a function. So it is, it is kind of new, right? So basically what we're doing is building a figure uh, by uh, a figure is defined, but, whate but by whatever the input is. So it's simply going a step back in terms of what we've been doing, because until now we, we always knew what we were, we were going to build. So we knew, okay, we are going to use the data from July and we are going to build a scatter plot or whatever. And now we are giving that option to the user and we, he will build or the program, the callback will build a figure with either July, August or September. So this is going a step back and building according to what the user wants or the, wherever the options are, right? And this is by doing a function. So I'll go back to the code. So th this is fairly new, but 
what you need to have in consideration. And this part that I have uh, selected, uh, ignoring the return, is what we've been doing. So we've been defining data, uh, the data, we've been defining the layout, and we've been defining the figure. What we're doing differently here is instead of doing the figure.show, we are returning, which is the output of a function, that figure. And we are building that figure according to whatever input the function has. So in this particular case, the only thing that makes this figure non-static or dynamic is this input value, which is the name of the column of that data set. So any questions regarding this one? Not regarding this, but uh, will you make this class available online? The recording? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat? I was asking if you are going to make the recording available online. Yeah, yeah, yeah I am. I am. Yeah, I'm recording. Yeah, yeah. Someone already remind me, reminded me of that in the beginning. Don't worry. But will you will you then upload it? Yeah, I've will I've been uploading. So I, I don't know if you received the email, but all of the classes, well, at least the, the these uh, web classes are in YouTube, since in, they were kind of heavy, so I couldn't put it in Moodle. So, but I can resend the the link of the YouTube page. Yeah, but, yes. yeah but it will be Thank there. So since we don't have a lot of time, uh, uh, I know one of you asked me, so let's just close this, about um, the not typing a hundred options in the DCC for the countries, right? So if you go to example four, which is a, a more complex example uh, of, of what you've done previously, so you can run it and then show it and then show the code. So since we don't have a lot of time, left so uh, ta -ta, okay so this is example four what we have here is three interactive options so i we didn't i couldn't i haven't haven't talked about it but it can have multiple inputs as you might imagine so here we can change the country that we're seeing or, or add or the de uh, delete the country so each line is a country we can see either the GHG emissions, F gas emissions, or CO2 emissions. And we can change the year. So feel free to change it. But as you can see, very interactive whatsoever. But you need to remember the data set, data set right? So, but what I wanted to show you before we end it, since we are already very close to it, is that here again we only have three countries but if you wanted to use all of the countries for example in that data set is basically all of the countries so it wouldn't be feasible to manually type all of the countries' names in the options level we can use this code which it is commented so i, I knew that was that would be something that you might want to use it so if you want to try to see all of the countries instead of just these three you can use this so this is equivalent to what is being done here, but for all of the countries in this particular data set. This is the, the emissions data set that we've been using for the examples. So if I, if I run this now, it's already running. Or running. So if I, if I show you now how it is, here, since it's in debug mode, whenever you change the code, assuming that you didn't, you didn't make a mistake, it will automatically change the application without you needing to rerun it, which is a very useful feature when you're building an application. So nevertheless, if you come here, now you can see you have all of the countries in the data set, even the country world, for example. Yeah. So, and since the data is there, you can just type it this is this this particular component is very good because if you want to search it by by letter you can type the letters and it will appear the countries that start with that letter right so nevertheless since we're finishing don't worry next class we'll go through this as well uh, 
uh, let me go back. If you if you want to see more about callbacks, you can see the example for. In the meanwhile, what I would ask you would want you to do is at least try to see one video or some things about building functions and filtering data sets with Pandas. It is in the, um, if you want bullet points on what to learn in particular, they were in the first class's PDF when I, I there one, like the third slide had like topics or bullet points of what you need to learn in Python in particular. So in terms of callbacks, it's, as you can see, it is required. And these are very simple callbacks. So for your um, project, you might want to do something more complex and you will need to learn to know a bit more about Python than it is expected until now, or, or uh, until uh, what we've been doing until now, right? So, but nonetheless, don't forget to close the, the app and that's it for today. Any questions? So. Would, I would just like to know, um, when we we made our our the solution that you showed us using that program which I don't remember the name building Eruku. the app Eruku, yes yeah Eruku, um, you you had a file that was the 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 pie uh, and you deployed it deploying it is just uh, copying or, or meaning that you just copy this file that we were watching now and you put it on GitHub and it's it's enough. Okay, we can, yeah, we can do that. So, so for example, I, you, I want to deploy this last application on GitHub. So first of all, you need to be sure that you're not using data or a data set from your computer. Here you, we are using a data set from GitHub, so there's no harm there. What you can do here is simply copy the code, you go to your GitHub page. Let me just go there. Up to, okay. So, so you have you have this right now. So uh, ignore the DV practical classes, but you have this. So you go go to the app.py. Here you have a generic. A gener you have an application. What you can do here is edit and simply delete the code that's there and paste this one. So you, you need you need to be careful with this because you need to have um, this needs to be well defined. You don't you can't be using data from your computer because this is GitHub. We won't find that particular data. So that's why we've been using data from GitHub. Also, you need to define the server and the server server variable. For example, here I don't have it defined. I don't know if you remember, but I tried to explain it that it was important only when you're deploying it to a server. So what I've done is I just copied that from the other example. And this is enough. So if I commit this, which means that if I change it in GitHub, it should print out this application on your web page. Okay, okay, I got it. Thank you. So yeah. So if I didn't make any mistake, let me just go to GitHub. So since I have automatic deploys, and it can only deploy once at a time, you need to be careful with that, not deploying at the same time as you are already deploying that that's that's something bothersome but if you go here in activity as you can see it's already deploying because i've changed it so you just need to wait a bit he, he will redeploy this takes like three minutes or something yes this le lesson was recorded uh, I will make it available on YouTube, so you don't need to download everything once at a time. And I, I can resend the link to your emails of the YouTube page. It's a page that I built, so it only has videos of the classes. So, but uh, going into this part, 
Okay, I can upload the link to Moodle. Okay, yeah. I'll uh, in the announcement section or something. So this always takes a bit to deploy because it needs to install all of the dependencies, which means all of the libraries each time it deploys. So, okay, launching. So it is already launched. So if I go here, open up, or I go to the link, it should have run without any issue. Yeah. Here it is. So, oh, and this one has all of the all of the countries. So, yeah. So, and that's it. So, whenever you build your application, you'll deploy it like this. So, does anyone else have any other question or? Okay, bye. So I'll stop recording.